afternoon, everybody. Happy Friday. Uh, it's a little cloudy, kind of gross here in New Hampshire. Uh, we're so excited to have our good friend John back. Um, uh, Tim Golden, founder of Compliance Scorecard, where we help your MSPs operationalize the governance, risk, and compliance pieces within your business. Uh, let's see, Mr. Tim, how are you today? Doing, doing great, doing great, and uh, really excited about this episode. Don Pryor and I, uh, former colleagues, uh, I got an extra R on my name there. <laughs> I'm fixing it. <laughs> Uh, you know, I like the, for the emphasis, um, but John and I used to work um, at a company called ICAP Oceantoma, which was known for its uh, patent and IP auctions that were really bringing together all the buyers and sellers of IP uh, globally. These auctions were all over the place. They were a lot of fun. John was actually a phenomenal live auctioneer, and we went to kind of work on different different careers. I, I started working in cybersecurity and John continues to be one of uh, the world's top IP strategists. So really excited about this, like Tim Schner, Inquisitive IT. Um, I work in the tri-state area, helping small businesses, uh, finance, accounting, law firms uh, to um, help with their secure IT. So Jesse, you're up. Awesome. Awesome. Let me pull Jesse up into the right spot so we have the right things, you know, trying to trying to do yeah. some new stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, I like this cool new scrolling thing you got going on, Tim. That makes it look super fancy. Um, trying. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm Jesse Miller, founder of Power PSA Consulting. Uh, we help MSPs to scale their security programs and do it profitably. Um, I'm as well, like Tim said, I, I love following John on LinkedIn and all the things he has to say. And I especially appreciate what he does from a VC cell perspective because he actually gets clients to listen about doing data tagging and data prioritization and data management techniques that always seem to find their way to the back burner. So again, excited for uh, the, the show today and getting to some maybe some pragmatic techniques that our listeners can take away to start talking with their clients about insider risk and um, how we can start structuring our programs around that. Awesome. Awesome. And Mr. John, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Let's get you up on stage. That's great. I mean, thank you very much, guys, for the uh, for the welcome, for having me back. Uh, really appreciate it. And I think, you know, to pick up on a, on a couple of comments, I, I'm really uh, psyched, motivated about the intersect of uh, intellectual property and uh, information security. I don't think either areas are given sufficient attention, but I, I honestly do believe living through the biggest ever misappropriation of corporate wealth in history through essentially through trade secrets. Love it, love it. And I suppose appropriation. Uh, go ahead. I suppose I, I ought to give myself the opportunity to say hello because I'm not getting really good at doing that from time to time. But uh, Who is yeah, it, Tim, Tim Golden, founder of Compliance Scorecard, as I kind of briefly said in the beginning, we help your MSP uh, take this whole crazy, scary thing, compliance, and kind of break it down into uh, uncomplicated meaning and uncomplicated methods for you and your MSP to kind of operationalize compliance, risk, and all that fun stuff. And so we're really excited today, uh, like I said, to have John, because you know we're gonna talk about uh, insider threat, ne negligent or, or malicious, right? And I know we have some topics here that we're gonna kind of get through. So uh, let's just dive right in, my friends. Yeah, yeah, so, um... John, you know, like I said, he's one of the world's biggest IP strategies, strategists. Um, I wrote a white paper probably a month or two ago about malicious insider threat. And um, specifically, you know, there's there's different kinds of sensitive data in a, in a small business, medium sized business, large business, right? There's the data you hold on behalf of customers, which is usually what regulators are looking for you to protect. and a lot of the compliance that Tim deals with is, is, you know, focused on, you know, customer data. Then there's proprietary and strategic data, which 
which John is referring to, you know, we're, we're, we're witnessing some of the biggest theft of corporate, you know, corporate assets in history, right? Like employees walking out of a firm, employees not being careful. Um, and there's two insider threats, right? There's malicious insider threat, uh, and then there's negligence, right? So like just having bad cybersecurity and your borders are open, your walls are open, you're easy to fish, that would fall under the negligent category. And then malicious is really this um, insider who was aware of great assets, um, <clears throat> you know, proprietary assets, could be anything, could be recipes, could be, uh, you know, decks, uh, sales lists, customer lists, right? Um, and then taking those with them or giving them out to a competitor for some kind of compensation. Uh, this malicious insider threat, like we usually hear about in the news, like someone leaked secrets to China, right? Like from a, you know, that's, that's more of a, na a national security concern, but this happens all the time uh, at corporate businesses. So, um, John, yeah, any, any thoughts? I, I was going to refer to a famous movie with, I don't think it's that famous with Julia Roberts and Clive Owen, and they're involved in corporate espionage, if, if anyone's seen that movie. L love the I movies, know. yeah. Uh, if you haven't, John, it's, it's, definitely a, it's definitely a weekend watch, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I know, but uh, yes, yeah. The, the 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 press that came out of the weekend over the guy, uh, and we shouldn't bang on about China and corporate espionage. But this, the, I'm not sure this was nation state espionage, but he was certainly corporate espionage. The guy had been working at Google for 15 years, spent an inordinate amount of time back in China, but uh, but nobody knew he was in China because his mates were still carding him into the office. Uh, but he was over in China, basically hype. Uh, you know, walking around selling uh, Google's uh, top secret <coughs> AI, uh, you know, code essentially, and hopefully make money for himself off the back of it. Uh, what he was doing, how he was doing it, Tim, and I'm, I was kind of surprised Google allowed this to happen on his MacBook. He was saving it down to notes, then he was transferring it to PDF, and then he was able to send it out, and it wasn't being tracked, it wasn't being identified. And so, you know, this guy who was former FBI. Director of counterintelligence said, you know, balls have been dropped here, left, right, and center. And, you know, three simple steps. One is, I know what your crown jewels are, number one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you need to get much better at identifying what is a crown jewel. Number two, identify the employees that are exposed to this. And this comes back to something you said the other day, Tim, you know, least, least risk, lean function, I think it was. And, and then number three, monitor those employees and the crown jewels. So if the guy's leaving and going to China, know about it. And it's not that hard to do to track that kind of information. But I guarantee the vast majority of businesses don't have a proper, you know, my experience, not a proper idea of what their crown jewels are because they change all the time, of course, depending yeah. on what's going on in the business. Yeah. Yeah, I think and that's Tim, really. Tim Golden, Jesse, before you jump in, Tim, yeah. Tim actually did something. So cybersecurity, we're going to call this asset inventory, asset mm -hmm. management, right, Tim? Like step one. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's amazing how like the parallels and the life cycle of IP is it just falls right in the line with cybersecurity as well. Exactly. I mean, you know, know, know what you have, know where it is, know who who has access. And I think this is where Jesse's going right before I steal his thunder is no, no. Go for, go for it. Where, where is it? Who has it? You know, all that fun things. Right. And so, Jesse, I know you were going to chime in. So let me play on up. Well, yeah, no, I, I, you know, I think it's interesting. And we talk about, uh, like John mentioned, the overlap of trade secrets, IP and cybersecurity, right? And that, while they there are some different pieces there, there's kind of like that Venn diagram where they do overlap in the middle. And I think uh, a, a simple pragmatic reason to get a crown jewels exercise done is that it helps you target and get aligned with the business and actually strategically position cybersecurity controls that help the business protect what they value most. So trade secrets aside, I still don't understand why we're not doing crown jewels exercises and identification kind of like the first thing in the door that we do as VC SOs and risk strategists for our clients. Because when you sit down and force leadership to think through what the most critical things are, and then align those things that they've said are critical with the controls we're proposing, all of a sudden that's telling a story and it makes a lot more sense. And we might discover that, hey, we've been doing some things that maybe 
we're not getting a ton of mileage out of. And so maybe we should shift efforts, take money and shift budgets. And that becomes on a business conversation. I think it's very powerful to do all those things for the security program, even aside from insider uh, and threat and IP protection, right? Yeah. So I'm going to, I'm going to be, I'm going to be the guy, right? I'm going to, I'm going to talk a little <laughs> bit through like, you know, we use these words crown jewels, right? Mm. Let's put this in terms that MSPs can understand, right? Like yeah. I'm not going to walk into my customer and say to them, uh, hey, let me talk about crown jewels because, you know, <laughs> they're going to be like, uh, no, like it's just weird to them, right? So if I'm an MSP and I'm trying to have this risk conversation, this, you know, yeah. discovery conversation, like, how do I even walk into that customer and be able mm -hmm. to start that, right? What is a pragmatic way for us to do that? Yeah. First first thing, Tim, if I may jump in, is uh, what's existential? Yeah. If this went missing, this got lost, if somebody stole it, mm -hmm. would that impact your ability to, to carry on as a business? Would that impact your right. ability to make money? Right. If so, that's probably going to be one of your most sensitive, most valuable pieces of information. Yeah. So existential, yeah. number one. Number two is then profit impact. If Would it impact on your profitability? Yeah. And then yeah. the next one down is, yeah, impact on the business, but not not that major kind of thing. So if you can categorize things in those three three areas, that's relatively simple to do. People get their head around it, in my experience, quite, quite quickly. You know, existential profit impact and just general impact and see how mm -hmm. you go. But I'd be really keen to see what you, you guys, how you guys do it that as well. That is wild that you just said that, John, because I literally have an explainer that I use with my clients. <laughs> it's like you were just reading <laughs> off of that. It's, it's, that's funny. The end of um, may be a lot better than mine. <laughs> <laughs> but that's it. I think, right, what's a high level crown jewel is something that's existential to the business. If the CIA was compromised, either the confidentiality, the integrity, or the availability of this data or system, does that pose an existential threat to our business? Right. Mm -hmm. And that's that's a really easy way to think about it. And to your point, uh, Tim, I think uh, I, I used to call them in, when I worked in the MSP as a, as a CISO with our clients and with our team, we'd call them applications or line of business applications. So you could call it critical systems. You could call it line of business applications. That starts to make more sense maybe to the client um, when you're dealing with a less sophisticated organization. Right. Gotcha. All right. So StreamYard's having a little yeah. bit of uh, like <laughs> lag. That was me. StreamYard's having a little bit of lagginess. So thank you, everybody, for your patience. I think um, that might be Elon with with uh, the satellite <laughs> with Jesse users. But, uh, or something. Yeah, there's Talk some, about there's a little bit of, you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All good, though. So so uh, so to kind of uh, just for the listening audience, maybe I have a little bit better connection. I'll just restate what Jesse was saying. And that is, instead of using words like crown jewels, maybe you use words like line of business applications, mm -hmm. or what well, we like to walk through like a risk, I'm sorry, a revenue process. Mm -hmm. What brings, you know, how do you make money, right? Walking into my customer as an MSP and flat out asking them, what makes you money? Because right. in right. that is the crown jewel, right? Oh, well, and we talked about this uh, uh, on Wednesday with our good friend Joe from Lion Guard. Like, as an MSP, I can walk into the baker. I can talk to that bakery about, like, like is your freezer more important than your fryer? <laughs> right or is you know the cashier out front more important than uh the milk right and so you can kind of start to have that conversation in the words that they're used to instead of crown jewel or line of business or apps or whatever having that conversation in terms that they can understand like for example hey do you care about your milk as a baker or do you care more about, you know, the, the cashier out front? Mm -hmm. right? well, I think it gets having... even, yeah, Tim, it gets even like fuzzy, right? Like how long has your business been? Like if the average townie came by, like would they know the name of your business, right? Like that's hard to, that brand and uh, what you're doing that's special in the market, right? Like that's hard to kind of, I don't know, convey or, or, like unearth with the customer usually, right? Like, as you said, you're mentioning kind of hard assets, physical assets, 
this idea of intangibles, um, as you said, what makes them money, I think is, is really, really, you know, that deep conversation that'll unearth these risks, right, as well on, on like, what's it gonna, like, what would have, what would have to happen to your business for it to, you know, stop, stop selling, right, or, or becoming, you know, the place that people went in that, in that community. So, um, you know, I think that, I think that, yeah, and great comment there. Uh, uh, if you want to pull that up, Tim, I don't have access to it. But yeah. So there our good are. friend, Bob, hey, Bob, thanks for listening. Glad to have you here. Um, you know, do the do the things, right? The the things. So <laughs> Bob, Bob, Bob teaches innovation, actually, and, and deals with a lot of IP. And, and Bob, John, he's a great person for you to connect with. Yeah. Um, down in down in Louisiana, he, he's a he's a professor or a visiting professor teaching about innovation, yeah. um, and we talk at length about this, like how startups protect themselves. Uh, what's the best way for them to protect IP to get you know a competitive edge very early when they're scrappy? So there he is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so Bob does bring up a good question. It kind of circles back to that, you know, things to protect physical cyber, so on and so forth, the C-suite. So uh, Jesse, you want to you want to chime in on a little bit and then we'll, you know, we'll get John's take on it, too. Well, he you know, he's exactly right. And I think uh, and this is no knock against the C-suite or any, anything like that. They have a wide variety of business risk that they're dealing with. And so cybersecurity is one little piece of that. And we got to keep that in mind. Right. But when we start broadening that that uh, overlap and talking about what's important to the business and what are business risks and how do our, our trade secrets and our intellectual property affect that and how do we protect those from a cyber lens and they're participating in choosing those things. Again, we want a mandate from the top down to say the, the executive team has stated that these are the most important parts of the business, most important data in the business, most important systems in the business and they have mandated that we protect them. And he said they are emotionally invested. That's what I really liked about Bob's comment, because that's true. You've taken them out of their whirlwind of all the other things that they're doing, and you've allowed them to uh, anchor in their mind why cybersecurity is important and why we need to do the things that we say that we're doing. Gotcha. That's good stuff. Good stuff. And just more comments coming in. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Perfect. It is. Thanks, Bob. Uh, um, yeah, it's got to come. It's got to come from the top, right? You, you've got to. You've got to get make them believe why it's important, why they need to protect uh, their advantage, and why they need to empower employees and, and right. build this kind of culture that um, <clears throat> it's not okay to just like walk out yeah. with lists and things like that. Um, I I put together some slides. I don't know if we'll get time to them, but I really talk about the life cycle and there's people, processes, and technology. And technology is really really only there to enforce policies. And the things that we're, I think, trying to wrap our head around right now, like having those initial conversations with the business leader mm -hmm. and building policy, right? Building, building a framework, building a way to think about like how we're going to protect this. Yeah. And cybersecurity starts to come into the picture, at least uh, from a tool perspective, um, to enforce those policies and, and make sure that employees do the right thing, right? So, um, John, yeah, any, any, any thoughts on that? And I know you're, you're yeah, good, good, good you're bandwidth question. Now, and, so. among, sorry, your bandwidth's pretty good right now. So yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what's going on with the UK and the and the sort of uh, bandwidth, but uh, yeah, my, I always say, and it's uh, very simple to say, and, and probably difficult to execute. It starts and ends with the employee, and the employee's understanding. If they've got a good understanding of what intellectual property is, what's most valuable in your business and why it's important to protect and defend that. The, the battle is largely won uh, because people are looking out for it, but it's often not the case that uh, people have a good understanding of what it is. I mean, let's be honest, intellectual property is a very nebulous concept anyway, and the vast majority of people really don't have a, a common understanding of what intellectual property is and they've never spent the time to do so. And that that in itself potentially in my my world at least my small world at least is a, is an issue. It may well be the same with with, with I, you know information security as well. But the terminology is designed to send people down avenues, 
you know, what, uh, patenting a copyright and all that kind of stuff is just gobbledygook, you know. But uh, but most people don't fully understand what what IP is, and hence they can't be looking out to protect it. And I, and as you said at the, at the top of the hour, that term, the majority of the majority of valuable information in the business is lost inadvertently by insiders, uh, not maliciously. I think you said fifty six percent or twenty six percent is is malicious. So. If you can, if you can train your employees, you're, you're trying to you reduce that 56. percent The the 26. percent Then you do need the technology, as well, to come to bear, and that's where you guys come in too to help track what's going on and who's who's downloading and who's who's exporting and so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah the whole the whole idea around either you know negligent or malicious, right? You know, for me, I start to think of um, are we as a small business, I'll put my small business hat on, are we as a small business, <laughs> um, are we are we just dumb and, you know, ignorant and ill-informed because we don't know that that the uh, the employer employee is going to just grab the list and walk out the door? Is that is it from like our executive piece? Like, oh, I, I never thought my sales rep would take my list and go work for my competitor. Is it that side or is it the, hey, I'm an employee and, and, and they're not like, I wanna make more money. So I'm just gonna steal their list and go to my competitor that's gonna pay me more money and I'm gonna bring my book of business, right? So is it that whole, you know, that whole neglect or is it ma malicious, you know, or is it all of it? Is it both sides of it when we think of, you know, insider threat? And there's a whole big conversation about where this relates into supplier risk, third party risk, and so on and so forth up and down the chain. But kind of bringing us back into the sort of topic of today, is it just ignorance and neglect or is it bad malicious employees or is it both? So Tim, you write a lot on this, but I, I think a lot of it is, uh, Tim Schnur, that is, is uh, it's always been there, Tim Golden. It's always happened, and uh, you know, the sales guy became becomes a CEO somewhere along the line in his career. He's taking powerpoints from one business to the next, and he's he's taking contacts and CRM information from one business to the next. You know, it, yeah. it's almost, and, you know my skill actually when I'm out there in the market, not me, but you know, is actually getting people to talk, talk over and above what they should be talking about, and I learned so much at that conference. Uh, but Tim, you, you've written a bit about this. I've, seen, I've read a couple of your articles. It's you know, along those yeah. lines, I think. Yeah, no, absolutely. And Bob, Bob had a great comment there. Uh, it's everything you've created, right? So I think that's the problem. And it's this, it's this expectation when you start to work at a, at a company. Are you a partner? Or like, are, you the, are you a business owner? Or are you an employee? And I think employees a lot of times think that, as they said, they created something, they created a deck, it's theirs. But if any of you have ever worked at a very large company, John and I have, um, you sign yeah. something when you work, mm -hmm. you, you know, you sign something from the beginning that says like all IP created is property of the company, right? Like yep. I've even, I've been involved, my name's been on a couple of patent applications actually. John, John was as well. Um, <laughs> but, but, but my name's on there as an inventor, but I am not the owner. I'm not the assigned right, right. You know, I'm not assigned rights of that IP. So if you have that expectation very early on, like bringing employees on and getting them to acknowledge that, that they are there, they're being paid, you know, they're being paid to work at a company and the IP that's created is not theirs. So they can't, they can't walk out the door. They can't give it to a competitor. Um, it, you know, so I, I think that's really important, just that expectation setting and <clears throat> you know maybe in a second here we'll talk about kind of the ip life cycle but that's really important right confidentiality agreements we've had on mm -hmm. uh even non-competes which i don't think non-competes are really needed anymore because if you have this declaration and acknowledgement of ip from the beginning it's much less of a problem so um oh, so what like you're California saying is or, uh you know, there's things right here where, like I said, we're not really getting into the cybersecurity yet, but we're getting into the people process policy, the governance uh, aspects that Tim knows so well. So, yeah. So what I was going to say when I was trying to rudely interrupt you, which I'm getting better at not doing is, <laughs> is 
Oh, you mean we should have a good employment agreement or a good MSA or a good contract yeah. as an MSP with our customer and with our staff, right? Mm -hmm. Jesse, have you seen any of this kind of stuff kind of flowing through in any of your MSP work? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the I think the better MSPs are, you know, having a works for hire clause like you would get with an independent contractor. And I mean, I think that's especially important. And John, you can probably talk about this at length later. But especially if you're working with independent contractors, protecting IP becomes even more difficult, right? So you definitely have to have some ironclad language around works for hire and having them declare any um, previous IP that they're bringing in or maybe IP that they're not allowed to use. You got to kind of suss all that out with, when you're you know, bringing on contractors. However, from a strictly MSP perspective, I know one thing sticks out in my mind. There was a there was a salesperson at one of the MSPs I worked with that uh, tried to walk out with a customer list. And um, we actually, you know, again, being we were very security focused early on. And so we kind of had a system uh, when we noticed things about an employee that made us think they might be leaving or there was something wrong there, we put monitoring on what they were doing in the environment, what they were accessing, right? And so we actually did find that he was pulling down a customer list and sending it to his personal email. We were able to catch that and, um, you know, serve him with a cease and desist. And um, mm -hmm. luckily, we, we nipped it in the bud, right? So um, that, that was a win, but I think... Uh, you know, do you catch that every single time? No, but I think to your point, John, it's about educating other employees and, and maybe he didn't know, you know, I wasn't in, I was not in management at that time and this MSP. So I don't know if he was malicious or he just thought, hey, I'm leaving. I'm gonna take the customers that I've worked hard to build relationships with and sell them something at my new, at my new job. So it, it could have been something that was actually benign. You don't know, but point being is, you know, what do they say? Uh, whether it's ignorance or malicious, it's still the same, right? Yeah. Uh, oh, oh, you mean you mean this? There you go. <laughs> Negligence, yeah. or <laughs> I'm getting better. Well, I'm getting yeah. better. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned uh, you put in things to monitor. You put in things to I hate to use the word catch them, right? You know, we know our MSP audience loves tools. We don't generally specifically call out tools, but I wanted mm -hmm. to have a, just a five minute conversation on. Are there ways that we as an MSP for ourselves and our customer to be able to like know, you know, you know, Sammy, the salesman just downloaded uh, an Excel document of lists and put it on a thumb drive and took it with them. Yeah. Is there tools that can do that? Is that just DLP or is that M3? Like, how do we do that from a practical standpoint since our, you know, there's a bunch of people here listening and they love tools. Yeah. Well, it's difficult, you know, it, it is not perfect. And that's why I think John is saying, you know, when the employee understands it, you're, that's where you get 90% of the, the issue solved. Of course, that doesn't solve malicious, right? Um, so, you know, yeah, DLP is uh, UEBA is another one, like, you know, a salesman is going to be accessing client records, right? But probably not a 1000 client records all at once. So if we have alerts set up for uh, excessive record access or things of that nature or certain type of exports being run or better yet, we don't let exports be run. So if they are going to try and take customers out, they're going to have to go click on every record individually <laughs> and screenshot it. We make it uh, more, uh, we make it more, uh, oh, what's the word? We make it more difficult uh, for them to, to, to do that. And so maybe that dissuades them and says, maybe I shouldn't be doing this. So those are yeah, all then. you know things you can do. That's a good point. Like when you get to that deterrent, right? So like, yeah, they see one person get caught and they're like, whoa, like, yeah, I don't think I want to, I don't want to be that guy that's getting sued by the company. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. In the financial services world, it's much more common. People get, you know, there's litigation on non-competes or people th stealing things or uh, because, and one of the reasons why there is litigation is because the evidence in the logs that these companies and their attorneys have are so good. Tim mm -hmm. just mentioned DLP, right? So this logging and tracking and access, um, the fact that they have their, as I said, least trust lean function, they have a very small surface area. They know exactly mm -hmm. where their data is, who's accessing yeah. it, when they're accessing it. Over the last four weeks before they left the company, they've got a rock solid case. And, sure. you know, 
stuff. Go ahead. So you, you, you mean they have like there's technical controls and non-technical controls in order to like bring this thing together, right? There we go. There we go. So uh, this, this is really the life cycle here and um, identify, protect, right? Like detect, respond, and recover. Like these sound familiar, right? From a NIST perspective, um, the same life cycle in IP, right? A lot of the people that are involved in risk management, I mean, a lot of the same kind of steps, five, you know, the five step process here. But we start with, I think the big circle right there. Uh, John can talk about this because this is really where I think he's heavily involved probably right, with NDAs and confidentiality and employee handbooks, as Bob Miller mentioned, all these things that kind of build that expectation, build that acknowledgement from employees that they, they need to do the right thing, right? Data retention policy is another uh, non-technical control that talks about like, how long do we keep data? How long do we get rid of data? Um, and John, you know, maybe you want to talk about trade secret catalogs, right? Like, I think that's a concept that don't, I don't, don't get caught on the word trade secret, but like, think about just anything proprietary. And maybe you want to talk about like how you do that. And then we can kind of come back to that diagram and talk about all the enforcement once you have the data classification and the data uh, cataloging, I guess you're, you're going to talk about, right? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you. And uh, just going back to the, the very quickly to the, the employee and the entry and exit from the, the business, you know, the first thing they, they learn about, as you said, is everything you create here is ours. It's all proprietary and you can't take it with us. And then as they're leaving the business, it's like, okay, so as we said at the beginning, everything you've created here is ours and you can't leave with it. And uh, by the way, uh, you know, those, those canny little HR qu questions such as what did you've learned while you're here is going to be most valuable to you in your new in new role. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, so uh, from, a, from a trade secret perspective, that valuable commercial and uh, inventive information, because we must remember, as we've alluded to here, it's both. A lot of people go down the avenue which has been invented. It's either a patent or it's a trade secret. Yeah. But also, as Tim's mentioned, it's commercial information. It's the market uh, research. It's the product launch, the new product launch that's coming up. It's pricing. It's customer list. It's profitability, profitability information. It's uh, managerial relationships. You know, who's getting on with who? Who's, who's, who's about to leave the business and, you know, et cetera. Uh, so like, in, like in John, case, you have cataloged your intellectual property. I mean, and by that, I mean to have captured it, date stamp it, date stamped it, when did you have it, and documented it. And if you haven't done that, it's very difficult to persuade the judge that you actually own that information at that said point in time. So it seems a bit <laughs> of an onerous exercise, but many businesses and you guys, you know, on the information side of things, when you're doing is information stuff you are recording a lot of information a lot of time mm -hmm. and it's not too difficult to found to convert that into something that could be in a trade secrets register but there's two components trade secrets register where information is captured but not the trade secrets and then separately you document the trade secret the code the algorithm you know the customer list etc you keep that separate in a separate uh, separate area a little metadata yeah so you're you're basically hashing this stuff you're going going deep yeah yeah, yeah so like gene, gene points out here like you know got to audit got to figure out what you have got to figure you know got to make sure that it's changed managed right all the all the things right so you can't protect what you don't know back to that whole conversation of of you know what is it? Where is it? How do we protect it? You know, as, as Bob points out, the policies and procedures, you know, all of that, you know, book of business, all that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. um, but what is next here in our little slide deck? Make sure I get that up here, right? Oh, wait. Hey, wait a minute. I jumped to the tool part like 10 minutes ago. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> I jumped the gun. Yeah, I think Jesse probably has a lot of experience on the tool side. Yeah. You as well, Tim, right? In terms of uh some of the tools you can log right so i think john was just really talking about talking to the customer putting them in that hypothetical mindset yeah. something really bad happened to your company employees stole something you're going to be in front of a judge in two years what kind of evidence do you want to have 
right? So you have a strong case. So I think, you know, that's who started to dig into that a little bit, Tim, as well. So. Yeah, I think the zero trust piece is a big, uh, a, a good way to start enforcing that and creating uh, landing zones that, you know, have least policy access to and only the, the right people should be storing the right things there. You know, one thing we don't talk about products a ton, but one thing I like about Confluence from Atlassian, for example, is the fact that everything's date tagged. Um, you can restrict, uh, you know, space access and they even have workflows now. So you could automatically tag something as intellectual property if it's completed in a specific space and only give people via SSO that are supposed to be working on it access to that space. And that's just one small, easy to do example, right? But you're getting all that tracking, all that stuff is created and it's just, and then the training piece is, hey, you guys can only work in this space. This is where, when you're working on this project, this stuff gets created. This is all intellectual property. This is all company owned material. You need to treat it as such. And it's not even a don't take it stuff. It's just, hey, it's good hygiene, security hygiene. But in the uh, piece of doing that, you're building in business process to start creating that register. And so I would love to hear from John as to what he's seen pragmatically that will work to start getting that catalog created. Yeah, so the draw, the draw, uh, but it doesn't have to be that complex. Uh, mm -hmm. You can run it on, a, on an Excel spreadsheet. Right. Fine at the beginning, but you can very quickly. I, I guarantee I can see most most companies in their engineering department will find demonstrations of some each. Each group of people very very quickly, and then you start to get an unwieldy amount. So you do, you do need to have the key things documented and captured, as we've said already. You know, right. what is it? You need some kind of code for it. What it, you know, some ID tag for it? What it is it? Mm -hmm. Some wow. summary of what it is, and then date stamp. You know, when was yeah. it created? Right. When's it going to be reviewed? Who's it? Who yeah. owns it? Uh, and that that goes to business process, right? Like, I mean, this is just another piece we put into, we're all about documentation and process here in MSP world, right? So a project close step is to complete the the catalog steps as part of the intellectual property tagging and clean that up, right? And you're looking at, you know, maybe an hour's worth of work that's additional to make sure that stuff gets recorded properly. And you're then you have that built into your system and it becomes uh, just another piece in the process that you're executing, right? So it's that iterative yeah. process. People in process, right? People yeah. in process. Mm -hmm. I, I want to roll back here. Go ahead. Come on. I was going to roll back to uh, one of the comments that came in. Uh, let's see if I can find it here. Uh, yeah, Jonathan here talking about BIA, right? Because, you know, we were talking about how do we do this? How do we have that conversation? What's the mm -hmm. pragmatic way of actually doing this alongside of our customer, right? And, you know, a BIA, business impact analysis, is a really good first step. Um, I have a lot of experience in BIAs um, and how that can maybe tie into insider threat as one of the items in a BIA. Jesse, I don't want to go on and on about BIAs. Do you have a little bit of a little bit of insight into BIA? Well, you know, uh, to, to the question, right? I think how this feeds into BIA, I think we kind of touched on that, right? And from a really high level is, you know, criticality of the data. Is it existential? Is it extremely uh, important? Or is it a minor inconvenience? And that's the way to think about it. You know, that's like that's like the easiest BIA you can do, right? Um, and I always try to put that into buckets. Is it existential, like John said? Um, is it long-term damage, meaning it will it could be? A, and I always try to put time frame on it. Like, can we recover from this? Yes, but it's take us six months to a year to get back up to where we were from it. So we have a year of either reduced profits or no profits. Can we weather that, right? And then, you know, like look at a quarter, a month or two, it'd be a black eye, it wouldn't be fun, but we can <clears throat> kind of we can kind of weather that storm very easily, right? And so, yeah, business disruption scenarios to consider, physical damage to a building. Well, maybe we're remote, so that's doesn't really matter for us, right? So it's creating that matrix of impact versus um, versus urgency, right? At the, at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's interesting because, you know, even just this, you know, this resource from ready.gov around BIAs, right? Mm -hmm. 
we're a SaaS company, right? We, you know, we work out of our home office, our people are remote. We're a SaaS company. New England just got nailed by some nor'easter a couple of days ago and I lost power and I had a whole boatload of meetings and a whole boatload of things I was going to try to get done. And I had no power and no internet. What was the first thing I did? I went and pulled out my business continuity plan and remembered, well, and started going through that and was like, I have a threshold of how long my house can be without power before my sump pump fills my basement full of water. <laughs> right? The talk about the physical damage, the talk about, you know, the the interruptions, the outages, mm -hmm. right? All, but where does that kind of, you know, flow into insider threat? Like I'm talking physical stuff. Well, insider threat can be that disgruntled employee insider threat can be you know whether it's malicious or neglectful that human that decides to take home the extra half dozen of eggs because oh well you didn't use the whole dozen i'm just going to take the rest home tomorrow and i do that day after day after day and now i'm the business is missing 30 dozen eggs because a little over time right whether it's malicious or not so um yeah anyways i, I mean I digress. A comment, and this is not like this idea of protecting proprietary strategic confidentiality information i just made a comment if anyone's seen the movie oppenheimer uh in new mexico right like they had them separated in different camps where each each speciality and this is this least trust compartmentalized right like well the people that understand this part of the project and this part of the project they're all in separate separate areas and they don't intermingle um so you know it's this isn't a very new concept please trust and and just you know how they how basically he was worried about you know foreign country the enemies right gaining that information so they, they had them broken up i don't know if this was oppenheimer's or the, mm -hmm. the general's idea but um you know it's this isn't a new concept uh just from a least trust perspective but um yeah so then do we do we have anything else on that other on the document, just on the life on the life cycle here. Uh, I mean, I need to go back to the other slide that I was sharing. Uh, hold on, let me do that. Uh, this one. Yeah, I mean, just the technical controls here on the right. Um, these are all things, like we said, that you can use to uh, enforce these rights and provide that evidence. Um, so, mm -hmm. you know, it's a, it's just, yeah. These are all like, as you said, MSPs. Uh, InfoSec guys, either, you know, if, if it's in-sourced or outsourced IT, everyone loves the tools. And these tools provide great okay. ability to provide that zero trust, great ability to provide uh, the tracking and logging, um, the reminding, as Jesse said before, it's a little bit of a deterrent. If the employees know that there's, if the, that there's great logs, um, certainly when I've worked in consulting jobs at banks and financial mm -hmm. companies, like, I'm not walking out of there with anything. I'll tell you that <laughs> um, the expectation <laughs> and just the presence right. of security yeah. is pretty high. So yeah, John, um, any, anything oh, they say, uh, uh, good locks, go make good neighbors. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Good fences make good neighbors. No. <laughs> yeah. Um, John, I know your uh, your internet's coming back and forth, but anything else to add? Really, like, you know, I, I, I talk about as you said, like, w why don't people realize the damages are so big, right? Like the fact that I guess are we just used to people not knowing, like, not maintaining their strategic advantage? Like, talk a little bit about that on how you, when you're working with your clients, like, how do you, you know get that point across because it's not in the news, right? Like it's not like malicious insider threat. And as you said, like the biggest theft of, you know, corporate, I, corporate assets is happening right now. And we don't think about it. So like, how do you, I guess, how do you get that message across? Oh, what I like about you guys is that you do the kind of likes really well. So it's kind of like this, it's kind of like that. And <laughs> I'm learning a lot from, from the way you do that. Because uh, it is about bringing it down to distilling it down to what's what's really important. This isn't malicious. This is this is a case that happened to me today. Big company, uh, very very successful, big tech company, 
and uh, one of the top employees is doing a a master's degree outside of outside of work and they said oh it's fine isn't it? i'm doing it all about our strategy and this <laughs> and he goes whoa, whoa. Oh, hold on you're doing your master's degree which is public information all about our, about our strategy so people just aren't aren't thinking about it but you know i i i haven't quite got these sort of uh these sort of analogies down to a t like you guys have but it's not something that's like somebody walked out with a bag of money something somebody got the gold somebody got the jewels somebody did the business over because data isn't that easy for, for the majority of people to get their heads around and so it's uh, it's not perceived to be a crime but but as you guys know when it when it happens the companies aren't shouting about oh so we've been, we've been done over by an employee we've been done over by a, a customer or a supplier that suppressed the learnings from it are, are, are minimalized because it's not it's not sort of processed and engineered and, and understood and and, it, and and that's a big issue i think so it's not mm. it's not socialized so people are going oh yeah, that's a big issue it's suppressed so people are going I've not really heard about that yeah. and then the learnings aren't happening so you know information is leaking and uh people are suppressing oh, it's not not much of a problem no 10 to 15 years worth of work on uh, our latest sort of chat gpt tool now that's not a problem at all no Really? <laughs> and I just well, have GP write my stuff for me and say, give me a protection thing and let me just give that and like, how do I protect my stuff dot GPT? Right. Yeah. Well, there, there's that whole piece is inadvertent training with trade secrets. So it goes, that, that's a great mm -hmm. point you brought up is, hey, if stuff is trade secrets, you can't go dropping it into chat GPT because we're training the model. <laughs> with proprietary yeah. information and you might as well put it out there just like anything else because so you know, acro yeah. across the pond somebody one of our competitors might type in how do i do xyz and they get this really great answer like wow i can't believe chat gpt thought of that well they yeah. didn't you yeah. just fed that data right into the model so yeah, should i know walter hayden, a, go ahead well, yeah, walter hayden go. had a great thing about this like even things that aren't classified as sensitive just by you having access to your environment, there's this idea in investment research called the mosaic theory. Like if you get two pieces of non-public, non-material information, you can come up with like right. material information, right? Like things that actually move the needle. And he's he made this point that you put in all this information, it's not classified, and if it's not sensitive, they can it's still dangerous because like it's intelligent, it can figure, you know, yeah. if this then that, right? Like it, it can think of so no, I, I, I think to... it's really risky, and I think the classification problem. This is going to bring this issue to the to the surface pretty quickly. Go ahead, Sam. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, without a doubt. Yeah. 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 Bob's got a great comment about unintended un, unintentional disclosures, right? So, yeah. uh, no, I was just going to make a joke about the whole <laughs> chat GPT. So, in other words, everything that I want MSPs to be searching for around what we offer for services, I should be training <laughs> chat GPT on and keep feeding it all the information when you're there thinking you of the CISO, go over to Power Grid. When you're thinking inquisitive <laughs> IT or you're thinking you know, IP and intellectual property or yeah. compliance, we should just yeah. keep feeding it all of our stuff, right? At least the public. How about this this week and maybe some, you know, LinkedIn kind of drips features in. So other people may have had this before I did. But, you know, um, oh, this well, the, the, these group articles that they're getting everyone to contribute to, like we're, they were, of course, training an AI model. And then on my profile this week popped up like, oh, want to know more about this subject? Click the AI button. And it's literally like almost it. reading back to me things that I've typed <laughs> articles yes, that I put into. And I was and, like. It's the little so, star sprite thing. Yeah. It happened to me, and I was like, oh, my God. Like, wait, I just – Jesse just wrote that, or Tim just yeah. wrote that. I know that because – what? This well, is, yeah, this, yeah. But, but, but like, to the mosaic, mosaic theory, right, you're talking about, Tim, yeah. is imagine that you've been using – learned trade secrets from your job to respond to those articles and all of a sudden linkedin is giving that information away for free yeah that's and that's I, what I think, you yeah, know, I just, walter just, was just, laying down yeah go ahead john just just jump jump in if i may because uh 
the property area is, is being challenged and like it's never been challenged before, as we know, copyright, LLMs, etc. But if you think about it, if you just bear with me for a minute, think about inventions. You read the patents or your trade secret or you publish. If you patent nowadays, within 18 months, it's published. And Tim knows this better than most. You know, two, three, maybe five years later, you get a granted patent. But now, that 18-month point, every single inventive LLM in the world is reading that thing and inventing on the back of it before you've even got a granted patent. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's, a, it's, it's strategically, you've got to really consider whether you're patenting or whether you're trade secreting. And right. how are you going to go and go and approach that? And there was some stuff in the news today about you know the uh, the weight loss drugs, which you know billions of people around the world are going to be taking eventually. Uh, they've got a whole new AI invent invention tool that's come up with a different way of getting around the patents of the the current thing, and you know dealt with some of the side effect issues. And Bing Bang Bosch, they've invented a newer, better prototype for for, for weight loss. So from an invention. In the perspective, it's a whole new game now. Patent, yeah. trade secret, published. There's lots of strategic measures to undertake because of what you've just been discussing yeah. on, on the LLMs and the. Yeah. The <laughs> <and stuff>. I've. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, no, but you know, John and I, I've heard people say this, and I'd love to get. It's a hot take, so I'd love to hear your opinion on it. But they said, you know, that really has signaled the death of the patent. Like we're not going to see patents anymore, and I don't know if you if you if you say, well, let's not you know, but it's not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. You, 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 you know my opinion. You yeah. know my opinion. Yeah. Oh, you know, Tim. Tim's Tim's a a big. Uh, he's got a big voice, big set of thoughts on this. Very clear in his opinions on this, and I, and I, and I tend to agree with him. Yeah. You know, the patent's been devalued quite substantially, particularly in the United States in the last ten years, and given what we've just discussed and other factors, you know. I think in the last six to eight years, trade secrets have got stronger and stronger and stronger. There's a whole bunch of case law coming out now. There's mm -hmm. really, you know, and as I said to you, I didn't say to you, but the UK has made its criminal law now uh, in certain circumstances. So, you know, it's getting stronger all the time. So, yes, you know, patents or trade secret or, uh, or publish is, is, is quite a substantial discussion. Yeah. But, but Jesse, if something can, if somebody skilled in the art, one of you guys knows the area, is likely to invent it in a short space of time patent it right because then you get some protection right. uh and or but you know with trade secret law you can claim prior user rights if somebody else does patent it etc uh, or you could publish it so yeah yeah, very, yeah very i mean times i market. tend yeah that, that was a bit of a loaded question of course i tend to agree with tim as it seems to me in most cases and it goes back to the impact analysis what kind of data do you have how secret is it like if you're doing more transactional and you're just you're winning off of like your operational efficiency how much money do you really want to spend trying to get a huge trade secret program going, right? But so it, it's a it's a risk analysis and an impact analysis on the types of data you have, right? But that said, is it it makes more sense to me that uh, being a pragmatist to just, just circle the wagons and protect your data through a trade secret program is going to be more effective in terms of high value data meant much of the time, you know? Yeah, that's, and that's just going to cover. How yeah, it's going to yeah. cover all those bases, Jesse. Right? It's going to cover. Right trade secrets that are tech, you know, I think the trade secret term is extremely wide and it could be even wider And the court, you know, if they're taking something that they, they signed and acknowledged that they wouldn't take and they took it. Yeah. Yeah. That's all there is. So right. as John started going to talk about case law, case law, trade secret case law is very strong and mm -hmm. foreign countries are stealing from us. So that's not, that's not like, you know the political narrative of patent trolls and we didn't even talk about that but <laughs> <laughs> no, these bad patent people that are just doing <laughs> people so uh trade secret laws is you know everyone agrees with um and yeah you know john started talking it's, about I mean, you, you, you've talked about this for a while trade secrets are much easier to to take to court and win because it's very easy to understand good and bad in a trade secret case mm. yeah. so the result the recent analysis says 86 percent of uh 86 percent win rate for plaintiffs with trade secret cases mm -hmm. it's kind of 57 percent for, for other wow. cases so that's a really high number 90 percent difference on yeah. trade secrets because they're easy <laughs> to for the courts the, the jury to get their heads around good guy bad guy stole it didn't steal it kind of thing so uh, yeah. really interesting on that side as well almost at the five minute mark here tim but one more thing i was talking to paul our our good uh 
patent broker friend and he was just talking about like the invalidation rate as well so even if you patent <laughs> things and you go to try to enforce them uh chances are the courts are going to say they're invalid so um but <laughs> at least in the u.s yeah maybe not in germany or korea or whatnot but tim so as we as we start to wind down here um we always like to end with a couple of key takeaways john i'm gonna pull you up first john and and, and have you kind of talk in talk a little bit about like what is the one or two key takeaways that we can have from today from you uh I can't use the word crown jewels, can I, Tim? So. <laughs> Identify yeah, I mean, what's most valuable in your business by doing that analysis that says, you know, what's existential, what's pro what's going to have a profit impact. Identify those things, protect them, look at them. Secondly, train your employees. Spend the time, giving them education. Because if you go to a secret case and the employee says, I have no idea what you're talking about, I don't know what trade secrets are, you haven't got a, you haven't got a leg to stand on. If you can evidence that you've trained them and they understood that, you've got a leg to stand on. So, yeah, identify your crown jewels, Tim, and uh, and training. Yeah, awesome, awesome. That, that, you know, that's a really good thought. So, uh, identify your crown jewels. All right. Uh, yeah, well, no, we won't get into crown jewels. We already did that. So, uh, <laughs> Miss, Mr. Schnur, my friend. Yeah. No. So, like I said, um, I had a post yesterday. Least trust, lean function. This really fits into this trade secret identification perspective. Your employees need to acknowledge that there's proprietary strategic information to data. Um, you need to protect it. You need to use tools to enforce that protection and you'll you'll be better off. And you'll they'll build an understanding and a knowledgement that like, you know, IP that's created on their behalf belongs to the company. So that that's really the big thing. Um, there is tons of malicious insider threat happening all the time, as John said, no company is going to admit it because they don't have to, because no regulator is asking them to be, to, tell, to expunge, like when they, you know, not, it's, if it's not customer <laughs> data, the regulators don't care. So mm -hmm. just get that out there right now that um, no one's really out there to protect you. You have to protect yourself here. And it's not something you can, I don't know, I'm not aware of something you can ensure as well. So awesome. Mr. Jesse, you are up, my friend. Yeah. Well, I'm going to continue um, what John had to say about the crown jewels. And hey, I, I have a I have a training paper that I wrote back in 2015 that talks about crown jewels, Tim. So just so you know, <laughs> but to, to, to continue that, I think, yes, you have to identify that and it has to be mandated from management. So there's a piece like identify it, who's identifying it, make sure that this is a top down driven approach that management is involved, executive leadership is involved in setting those standards. And it's not just an exercise that's being done in the IT department. So I think you have to build consensus with the crown jewels and then use that consensus to identify the lowest hanging fruit in terms of technical controls being UEBA, which there's some good stuff coming out for now, but even then just doing things like least access and uh, ZTNA, zero trust network access, things like that. So I think those are the two things that you can continue on from the strategy piece to the tactical piece when you start to implement these programs. Awesome, awesome. And so uh, I suppose I ought to have a key takeaway too. Huh? I always forget to like bring myself up and talk about- Johnny's lug nut, tell me about it. Yeah. Well, you know, I think as far as, you know, insider threat, whether it's uh, neglect, whether it's uh, malicious, whether it's ignorance, you know, all the things that we talked about today, you know, from a business perspective and from an MSP into that business perspective, starting to have that conversation with your client and begin with the risk conversation, begin with the revenue competent, uh, conversation, you know, begin with the uh, reputation, risk, revenue, reputation, what is going to impact your client's business as a whole. But even putting that part aside, think about your MSP yourself. You have a lot of proprietary information, not just on yourself, but on all your customers as well. Right? When you're thinking about the insider threat that can happen within your own MSP, bring your team together, have that conversation, talk about it from top-down approach about why you want to protect this stuff. 
have the why conversation, right? Not just the, you know, Johnny, you know, don't do this, don't do that. You need to be able to have the why conversation around why this stuff is important. All right. So, uh, hey, if y'all didn't know, we have a podcast. Head on over to teamtim.live. <laughs> Click on the listen and you can subscribe and listen to this podcast while you're driving, while you're mowing the lawn, while you're, you know, dealing with the cows, uh, Dr. Jesse. Uh, you know, so we now have all these episodes <laughs> heading on over into a podcast format. We're waiting for the Apple piece to get approved. So we'll be on the we'll be on the Apple Fies and the Spottle Cast and the you know all the different podcast areas so feel free to head on over to the see the team tim live at the bottom and yeah. and do and do and do the thing do the thing so uh thank you everybody um next week real quick uh let me pull this up here uh conferences are they worth it um you know a friend of ours uh she, mm. she's been she, anyways i won't get into all the gory details this is a little bit of a hot topic, a little bit of a controversial topic, right? Are they worth it? Are they worth it from a from an IT MSP perspective? Are they worth it from a vendor perspective? Oh my gosh, there's been, and we're about to dive into conference season. I know we're a minute over here, but I think this is really important. Do the like things, the subscribe things, the listen things, and make sure you come on over next week and listen to this uh, episode about conferences. Uh, thank you, everybody, for, for being here. And we're out, my friends. Let's do this. Subscribe now.